is your relationship with time? Are you wired and tired, stressed and overwhelmed, busy and going nowhere, or just want to scale your business? Welcome to Take Back Time with your host, Penny Zenker. Penny focuses on books, strategies, tools, and tips to help you work smarter and approach your time more strategically. As a result, you can have more energy, focus, and get more done in less time. Be more efficient and effective. Get ready to take back time. Hello, and welcome to Take Back Time. My name is Penny Zanker, and I'm always looking for people in different businesses, in different areas to get some different perspectives for you on how you can take back your time. And today I have Tommy Mello with me. And, you know, like many businesses, business owners out there, he says he didn't grow up with a silver spoon, but he's worked his butt off to figure out what works. And he's developed his business into a greater than a $50 million business with over 360 employees. And so he shares on our show some really great practices as a leader of what he does to help to create greater loyalty and ownership within his team. Some of the practices and, you know, he has a lot of accomplishments behind him. He's created this home service brand and he's also written a number of books. So the home service millionaire as one of them, as well as the podcast that he runs, which is the home service expert. So whether you're in the service business or not, it doesn't matter. There's a way to lead your people. There's a way to grow your business. And Tommy shares some of those smart ways to do that so that you can take back time, grow faster and more sustainably. So without further ado, let's get to Tommy. So Tommy, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for being here. I'm excited. Yeah. So I'm excited too. You mentioned something just before we turn this on. You said that you're obsessed with business. So let's talk about that. Like some people, they knit for fun or they go and they cycle or play tennis or whatever. So do you do business for fun? Yeah. You know, I don't feel like I go to work at all. You know, this past year we did 74 million. My budget for this year is 151 million, which is over hundred percent growth. And, you know, I love key performance indicators. I love I call it BYB, better your best. And I'm not competing against anybody else. We're the largest garage door company in North America that's not franchised. And you can see the books I read all the time. Mm-hmm. And I just, I'm fascinated with just goal setting and just hitting these goals. But, you know, one of the things we'll talk about later is culture too, and, and enjoying the journey and bringing people with you as well. So, mm-hmm. so just for curiosity, you said you're, you know, you really love KPIs and, being able to meet those. Is there a system that you use like, uh, you know, traction yeah. or, uh, yeah, you know, I like, OKRs. you know, Wickman and all that. And yeah, yeah. OKRs. You know, if I walked into your business, here's what I would do. I'd whiteboard out and I'd say, how much revenue do you want? And then I'd say, what's your average ticket? What's mm-hmm. your conversion rate face to face if it's home service? And then what's your call booking rate? And then what does it cost you to acquire a customer? Those are the main five KPIs. And when I look at that, I can literally double a company overnight by just finding the holes. That's right. And once you got those figured out and they're good, then you just dump gasoline in it and continue to feed the engine of leads. I think what we've done pretty well in the last couple of years is I have seven full-time trainers and four full-time recruiters. And I just walked upstairs. I didn't know the guys arrived today. We've got 17 guys that are training right now. They're here for a month. They just finished their apprenticeship program. And I think the key to success is building something that people want to work for. There's a guy named Darren Hardy that wrote a book, The Compound Effect. And in the book, he explains he was younger and he wrote down 100 things he wanted in his life partner and a woman. Mm -hmm. And so he wrote down all these attributes, everything, 100 things. I could only come up with 10. And (laughs) he looks at his list of 100 things and goes, man, I can't get it. I can't get a woman like this. So he had to write down 100 things that he'd have to become in order Mm -hmm. to even be deserving of a person that he drew up. So I kind of went through the same thing, but I said, who do I got to become as a company? How do I want people to break through walls to come work here? And that's really, we just hired a dream manager, someone that's helping people accomplish dreams within the company and really let them win. And, you know, my vision had to be so big that it's got to be able to handle 400 other employees to let them get their dreams and their visions. So absolutely. You know, so I'm a big believer in big goals and big dreams because You know, I think when, you know, kind of like the compound effect is that, you know, there's building on top of what you have and that compounds, but also when you get that 
big goal. People can't think the same way just to grow incrementally. You're talking about a 10 X, which means that you have to think differently. You have to approach it differently. Like you said, who do you need to become and how do you need to think around that? You know, it's easier said than done with one person, right? You're talking about doubling your business. That means that you're also going to, you know, increase your sales force or your team considerably in order to make that happen. Correct? Yes. And it's about infrastructure and systems and KPIs and goal setting, but really becoming a powerful delegator. And one of the things that's very hard, and I told you before we got on here, is there's certain things I have to do. But for the most part, I don't open up my own email. I don't open up my own mail. I don't, I trust a lot of people to do a lot of things. And as good as I might sound, I'm horrible at so many things. (laughs) And I've identified my weaknesses and hired around them. And I think that's key is I don't have anybody that's a visionary because if I did, I would be, Hmm. you know, we'd be probably butting heads. I have everybody. Or you'd be even higher than before. Yeah. Never know. A lot of integrators though. These people around me, I mean, I've got, I'm sitting on the uh, shoulders of giants. I mean, my staff, I call them my coworkers. There's just my internal customers. They're the most amazing people. And, you know, I've got this great ideas, but I can't do a lot of it. So they do it for me. <laughs> right. So that's what I want to talk about is your people, right? That's right now with, you know, the great resignation, you know, you're hiring a lot of people. I don't know if you're seeing people resign as well. I really want to talk about the idea of how to, you know, how are you instilling ownership in your people? And I want to ask you some questions around that, but how do you get people to stay, how to be motivated, how to want to fulfill that big dream with you? Yeah, that's a great question. I, um, I really ask what, you know, the old JFK, what can I do for you basically is um, I celebrate home ownership, good credit scores. When people quit smoking, we celebrate good weight loss. We celebrate things, you know, we can talk all about conversion rates and our goal setting internally as a company, but now I've been fortunate and God's blessed me very, very abundantly. And now it's more about the journey and I'm having more fun share stuff with people and letting them win and letting them become good moms, good dads. You know, a lot of people break down sometimes and they tell me I became a better father and now I'm spending more time with my kids and now I'm a better husband or wife. I try to think about, well, a lot of times we don't talk about money in school. We don't talk about these things. First thing I talk about is money. I say, listen, I give everybody a tithing envelope that you do at church. And I say, yeah, just donate as much money as you got in your pockets. Then I say, I'm just kidding. I pass them on, then I collect them. And I say, you know, if the priest and the preacher could talk about money for 10 minutes of every sermon, I'm going to talk about money. We're going to talk about depreciating things like your RV and your motorcycle. We're also going to talk about compound interest and how appreciation works. And, you know, we describe to the Dave Ramsey program for every employee here. And I just think the more we could provide... It's amazing what happens when you take care of your people. And I, we do okay. I always think I could do a lot better. But overall, I, there's one thing I can tell you is I do care. I had a line outside of my door of employees when this nasty virus came about. And they walked in one at a time and offered to give all their PTO, take paid deductions. And we didn't end up having to go that route. But it was amazing when you see the loyalty and what these amazing folks around me are willing to do. And so now it's like, I just feel like I'm, I got to get back as much as possible and take these, take them along for the journey. And we're having a lot of fun doing it. And like I said, I don't feel like I go into work. I feel like I come here even on a Monday. I'm excited to get in because if this is work, you know, I get on the phone a lot. I'm in a lot of meetings, do a lot of podcasts, but it's fun and I enjoy my life. And I think it's all about, that's the thing is letting them win and and showing appreciation of the five love languages. There's five levels of appreciation as well. And I think those are important in the workplace. Oh, what are those five levels of appreciation? That's something that you follow within the organization? Yeah, so there's a, you know, there's a million things, but I've got the test you could take and it's the five languages of appreciation in the workplace and the same languages of, uh, you know, words of affirmation and some people like gifts and a lot of people, they like recognition and we've got employees of the month and we celebrate our big wins. I tell somebody a few years ago, I used to draw an unhappy face and a happy face. And we go over KPIs. And this guy told me, he goes, you remember eight years ago, he came in my office the other day. He goes, eight years ago, you said, basically, no one's a loser, but this is the losing side. I put my head down and I walked up, put my numbers on the whiteboard. And I remember telling myself, I'll never be on that side of the board again. And we're too big now to be have every guy writing their numbers up. But I think it's important to give appreciation to the workplace. 
And I'm a good cop. I hire everyone, like my manager, the assistant, Adam. I said, if you're going to come on, you got to be the bad cop. You got to do all the firing. You got to do all the performance improvement plans. So I've shied away from having to ever do anything. If you lie, cheat, or steal, I'll fire you like this. That's not right. And that's the moral. But if you're a good person, but just aren't successful, it's hard for me because I care. But part of me says, you know, 400 employees, they're each taken care of usually around three people. So that's 1,600 people. You got to make the best decision for the whole organization to move on. And you're feeding a lot of other people. So some people have to pay the price of not working here. I tell people, you know, if you don't hit your goals, I'll give you the opportunity to work for one of my competitors. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a good point. You have a lot of people. You can't please everyone, right? You make the best decisions that you can that's going to move the company forward. You know, I really want to hone in around this idea of creating ownership in your team, right? Because there's so many people who say, oh, my people aren't accountable. The new generation, you know, they're not motivated. And I really think that it's, you know, we have to look at ourselves as leaders and say, you know, if our people aren't motivated, they're not developing themselves, you know, part of it is a leadership question as well, right? I mean, maybe at the end you need to part because people don't have the skills or it's not the right fit. But I think that it's too easy to point fingers right? At other people and say that it's everyone else's fault and everyone else's problem. And I've been there, right? But I learned that got to take a look in the mirror first. So, you know, I want to talk about some of those leadership principles that get people in a place to walk into your office to say, I want to reduce my hours so that more people can stay or what creates that level of loyalty. So you've got these levels of appreciation and it sounds like you go out of your way to make people feel special and important. What else do you think helps people when you make a decision that everybody might not agree with? What helps them get behind you and do it anyway? Well, number one is that I run a, it's not a dictatorship, it's a democracy. So we've come up with reasons and I love people with opposing views. We do what's called a SWOT analysis on a lot of our decisions. And we look at some of the weaknesses. I like it when people have a valid case and we, we go through a healthy debate. We set our budget, like I said, 151 million. And I asked my president of the company, to not be there. I said, I need you to push, but I need them to come up with the ideas. So what I try to do is I plant little seeds and I water them. And I don't think people realize I'm doing this, but I help them come up with a solution that they feel like is their idea. And most of the time it is their idea, but I sway them in a direction. But if I set the budget of our- If I'm understanding correctly, you set the frame. And am I understanding that you'll get them, let's say your leadership team or whoever it is that you're having work on a particular problem, you'll get them in a workshop and they'll work it through together. Is that? Yeah. So letting them come up with some of the ideas and then just, you know, I think a lot of times I had a guy teach me seven power contractors names, Al Levy. We've got manuals. We've got an org chart. We've got a depth chart. We know who's in control of certain departments. There's leadership, there's delegation and a manual. People say manual is manual, right? But here's the thing. When I was in seventh grade in gym class, my teacher, my gym teacher would give us this one pager and one of them was basketball, the next week soccer, the next week. And it showed us how to play the game. It showed us what a free point shot was versus a three pointer, showed us with offsides and how many, you know, it showed us how many minutes in the quarter, whatnot. And so the manual just teaches us how to play. The KPIs are the scoreboard. And I think a lot of times people start and they don't even know how to win or lose the game. And it's really unfortunate because people want to know they're doing good. And people say, well, he didn't do it. Like no one does it. Like I do it. If I don't do it, it won't get done. Right. They're not the owners. And, you know, I notice when the fan blades don't go the same speed. I notice when there's one light bulb out, I notice these things. And sometimes I get upset. I said, how does this, nobody, who uses the last toilet paper, whatever it might be. All right. Everybody wants people to be the owners. Well, they'll be your competition. So unless you give them the opportunities to succeed, and it's very clear, I love Henry Ford because he came up with an assembly line. He hired specialists at one thing and they were monitored at that one thing and they got very, very good at it. They didn't get a jack of all trades because a jack of all trades is a master of none. And that's what I try to do with an org chart and get people to dial in on one thing. And that's part of the way we create leadership. And then just, I'm a big fan of accountability and deadlines and checkups. But when we delegate, I got funny because this is sitting here because I pulled this out the other day, but to my steps of delegation here, and there's eight steps. Here's what needs to get done. Here's why it needs to get done. There needs to be an explanation of why we're doing things. Absolutely. Here's what you have available to get it done, your resources. Here's the priority assigned to it. Here's when it needs to get done by. Here's the meeting schedule checkups, check up on progress. 
here's the consequences or the gifting or whatever, you know, if there's a prize involved or whatever of, you know, there could be a bonus. And then the eighth thing is an opportunity for feedback after we get done to see if we can get it better. And as great as it all sounds, it's different. In fact, using it all the time, because when you use it correctly, it gets done right. Absolutely. So would you say you mentioned feedback? Do you have uh, structured feedback processes that happen consistently in the organization? So are you familiar with what a net promoter score is? Uh Uh-huh. Yes. So there's an internal NPS and the promoters are nines and tens. We do a lot of, we got this thing called SurveyMonkey. You're probably familiar with it. Sure. And we send out internal surveys all the time that are anonymous. And I love feedback. And I love, I got to tell you, I like bad feedback. I like to know what we need to work on. People sometimes hate negativity. I strive to be better because I want to know what we can do better. And the one thing that I'll tell you is with as many employees as we're at, I can't be there every time. If I spent five minutes with every employee, my whole month would be gone. Right. So I had a guy sit in here one time. His name's Julian Skate, and he's the uh, CEO of Nextstar. They have 900 HVAC plumbing electrical companies that they consult. And he said, Tommy, I think you'll do amazing things. But he goes, the one thing that I really think you need to really discover is how to build your leadership. He goes, because you're amazing. But how do you build this into each and every person that, and get them to care like you do and get them... A lot of times I'll sit in meetings and I'm like, guys, this is boring. Let's have fun. Let's get passionate. Let's tell stories. And I try to get my guys fired up. I'm just, I'm shaking hands and kissing babies now. So that's kind of what I've become as a cheerleader in this company. Okay. And so how do you do that? How do you get those leaders to develop themselves and be better leaders? Well, we bring in a lot of consultants right now. I got a guy named Jonathan Wisman. He wrote a book called The Sales Boss. I've hired a lot of consultants. We go to leadership training all the time. We take them. I try to get them out to visit different shops that are the last few shops we went to were over 500 million shops, not in garage doors in different industries. And Right. See how it's done. Well, that's the best thing you could do is go out there, put yourself out there, ask a lot of good questions. And I try to not say, go to a local shop. No, I say, fly somewhere out of the state, make it an experience, get in out of your comfort zone, ask a lot of questions, meet with the CMO, talk about marketing, talk about how they train. What are their secrets to recruiting versus hiring? The hiring is going on a job board a lot of people go, I don't get it. Nobody shows up for their app. I put it in it. I'm like, well, how much do you spend on marketing? They're like 10% or whatever. So they do 100,000 a month. They spend 10 grand on marketing. How much do you spend on hiring and recruiting? Oh, you put an ad on Craigslist and you just expected everybody to come to you right. for $35? Right. It, That's funny. marketing. You got to market right. for great people. And every time, you know, whether we were having beer and pizza on a weekend or whatever, I, I try to get those magic moments on video and share it on social media. And I'll tell everybody, Take out your phone and I give everybody $1,500 if they get an employee to come to us. I had a guy make 15 grand last quarter. And, <laughs> you know, I'm obsessed with recruiting. I wrote down on my whiteboard on the top right corner, I wrote down a billion dollars and I drew a line to the bottom left and I drew five year increments. And I said, How to get to a billion? Well, a good technician will do 500 grand a year. So we need 2,000 technicians. And I broke down a, a kind of an, a hockey stick growth curve and I just did the math. It was pretty simple. And I said, we're going to need a really big training center. We're going to need an LMS, learning management system. We're going to need KPIs that track other things than just booking rates and stuff. We need to track employees' lives and their happiness. And my managers all walked in and I said, hey, guys, we're going to do a billion in five years. And they looked at me and they didn't know what to say. They said, you're a dreamer. They basically looked at me like I was crazy. And when I showed them and I sat down for an hour, Mm -hmm. they all walked out of here going, we're going to do a billion dollars. And I said, here's the path, but what do we got to do today? What do we need to do next month? A lot of people have these crazy dreams, but they don't have any way to get there. And I think what it needs to happen today in my business, in my life to change. Everybody's got next week. Next week, I'll quit smoking or quit drinking or start working out or go on a diet, whatever it is. What do I need to do today to make these things happen? And it's taking action today. And I think it's hard for a lot of people to do that. Absolutely. Well, what I heard from you was a couple different things. First of all, you said it earlier as well, you know, whatever, shaking hands, kissing babies, whatever. You're sharing the passion, that your passion is contagious. And when you're passionate about it, they're going to be like, whoa, okay, tell me more, right? So they're interested in it. So I heard that. That's important that the leader brings their passion of their vision. I heard you say that you break down the path, right? It's one thing to throw a big number out there. Like you said, you know, people be like, whoa, you know, that's, uh, that's really big. That sounds really far. But a lot of times they don't recognize where the gap is and how much easier it is when you break it down the way that you did, right? Well, that means this many technicians, you know, with this much. And then it makes it 
ah, oh, okay, it's a clear path. It's doable, right? So I think that you help to take that vision and you help to simplify it for them in the kind of clarity that they can own it. Yeah, it's got to be digestible. You remember what about Bob, the old movie? Uh-huh. Uh, where he, he was like, baby steps. I don't know why I just thought of that, but it's uh-huh. literally, it's you crawl before you walk, you walk before you run, you run before you sprint. And understanding that just getting started is half the battle. You know, I tell my guys, someone will have an amazing day and I'll get them to the front and I'll have them talk. And I said, what's the key thing? What did you do? And it's always always the same answer. And I said, let me guess. You know, all you got to do is ask. You want to go on a date? Listen, just ask. And if you get no, get comfortable with rejection. There's a great book called Go for No. And I recently bought one of my biggest competitors out and we went out to lunch about a year ago. And it was just a cheap Hispanic restaurant and burritos and tacos and whatnot. And I said, hey, I think I got one of your coupons because I knew they had coupons. I didn't have it on me. And she goes, how much was it for? I'm like, I think it was $4 off. She goes, okay. Mm -hmm. And she gave it to me. And the guy looks at me and he goes, do you always do that? I'm like, pretty much. I'm like, I asked. And guess what? A lot of times that's the hardest thing is just asking. And I'm comfortable with rejection. I got to tell you, I went to every one of my dances in high school. And I didn't always get yes. Some girls said no. But what I learned is just, it's their loss is what I look at it. Yeah. My mom taught me that as well from a young age. You don't ask, you don't get. It's no harm in asking. They can say well, no. And it's the way that we ask too. I um, was recently at an event. I pay a lot of money to go to this thing. And the guy walks out there and he goes, who here wants to be a volunteer and come out on stage? And I'm new to this group at the time. And I didn't want to be that guy. But he said, let me ask you guys this. Who here wants to be the best husband or wife, become a better natural leader, have the best sex life ever, have a different way of their walk. And he starts going off and literally for five minutes. And he goes, when you get off this stage, your life will be changed forever. There'll be a twinkle in your shine in your eye, a glimmer. And that everybody was begging to go on stage after that. And so I start with, listen, I don't have any kids. I want kids here the next 10 years. I'm getting old, but I guess I don't have a bubble here. But if, when I have a kid, whether it's a boy or a girl, boy in particular is, if you ask a girl out, first thing you did is smile. And I tell my guys all the time, it's kind of hard to do, but just stare in the mirror and smile. Even when you talk, you could hear when someone's smiling. Right. And then eye contact and body language. And I talk about these things all the time. And I'm like, listen, one of my guys calls me, this was two months ago, and he tells me how much he's letting me down. And this is in Michigan. We're in 19 states. And he goes, dude, I'm dropping the ball. I'm letting you down. I said, dude, stop right now. Are you near a mirror? First thing you need to do is tell yourself you love you. Second thing is smile. Pull your shoulders back and own it. When you walk in, slow down, smile, and enjoy your life. He calls me up after the next job. He did $7,000. He never did never did over three. Next job, he got $7,000. I said, they're buying you. And if you believe in it, you're the doctor. And the doctor asks questions, and he smiles, and he enjoys it. He sits down on his desk after he checks out your ears and makes you cough and does all that stuff. And then he asks you really good questions. And then he gives you a diagnosis and he might write up a prescription. Do you ever go when he gives you a prescription? Well, how much is that going to cost? You never ask your doctor how much the prescription costs. You say, this is what I need to get better. And I said, that's what we are. We're the doctors when we enter the garage. I just love, you can just tell I love this stuff. (laughs) Absolutely. Well, that's great. And that sounds like by you sharing these stories and these nuggets of wisdom that it helps people to reframe where they are, to see things, you know, see their better self and to reach for it. So You ever heard of Simon Sinek? Sure. So there's this story and there's this lady. She lives in this tribe and it's at the bottom of this base of this mountain. And there's this other tribe at the top of the mountain and they're bad people. They're a bad tribe. And one day the baby goes missing, her little baby that she just had. And they had a couple trackers in this tribe to try to go track where the baby was up at this bad tribes in the mountains. And they got halfway up and they're literally stumped. They didn't know how to get up there. They just, they were getting ready to turn back around. And all of a sudden in the distance at the top, they see the lady running down this big hill of a mountain and she's got the baby. And they said, how did you figure out how to get up there? So she goes, it wasn't your baby. Right. <laughs> and the point is she figured out a bigger why. Right. And if people know the direction and why you're doing this and what you're going for, it changes the whole perception on what we're trying to do. And, you know, we raised 25,000 bottles of water for the homeless in the summer here in Arizona. One of my technicians walked outside of Walmart and he's 22. He was homeless for a year, lived out of his car before he started working here. 
And he gives the lady $20. She was handicapped. She was an amputee missing one leg. And she goes, I don't want your money. She goes, all I need is a bottle of water. And so he goes into Walmart and gets one of those styrofoam coolers and fills it up with Gatorade and water. And then he gave the lady water. He stayed with her for a half an hour. She got rehydrated and he bought her a bus ticket and helped her get on the bus. And he comes in and he says, Tommy, he goes, we have to do something for these people. They're dehydrated. So we did this, but it was a bigger cause. And all of us got really into this thing. Absolutely. And we did jackets in Michigan for the homeless people. We painted the YMCA. We feed the needy. We do this thing called shop with a cop. And I had this little girl <laughs> and they don't get anything, right? They don't have Christmas. <laughs> I'm sitting there tying her shoe. And I felt so bad because they only had like a hundred dollar budget. And the first two things she grabbed were like over a hundred bucks. So I got her some more stuff, but it was like, if there's a bigger reason, a bigger why, a bigger cause to all this, you know, we planted trees. We try to do something every month. We donate to uh, wounded warriors. We do a lot of garage doors, but I try to let them come up with ideas. So they're passionate. We've donated a lot towards uh, breast cancer. We had one of the guy's moms that beat breast cancer. And we, we did a marathon for that. But th- it's really understanding your why is so important. Of, and my why is, it's easier to say now because... I don't have as many bills as I once had. And and I've been very fortunate, like I said. So now it's like, it's more legacy. It's like, what can you give? How many lives can you change? And I think that more people are starting to see that. And it changes the dynamic. It changes the culture. There's a different reason for showing up. Yeah, I think that's true. I think people really do rally around a bigger cause and where they see that you're sincerely, you know, interested as an individual and as a company to make a difference. I believe people definitely rally around that. And I think that's the difference with the younger generation is they want companies that are more purpose-driven. And I think that's forcing a good change. You know, everybody says millennials, and I'm right on the borderline of a millennial. And, you know, we want to be valued. We want to grow. We want to be listened to. We want to be involved in the decisions. I want to see a ladder that I could potentially move up in the company. The benefits are almost a given now. And in this day and age, the flaws come out all the time because there's so many choices. And people say, man, I can't find anybody. I said, well, look at your app. It says must, must, must only have to, I'm like, most of my stuff says everything about who we are, a family and everything. By the way, we do garage doors at the end of it, but it's, it's not must be background, drug, blah, blah, blah. Of course that stuff comes eventually. We do drug tests and background checks, but you know, it looks like you're trying to get parole or something with with these things you put on Craigslist and Indeed. That's another thing too, is is if you look at my Indeed or my glass door, I actively went out and told my employees, would you do me a favor and let me know how I'm doing? Personally, I want to know. And they went on and we got 4.7. I mean, you always get the unhappy guy that gets fired or girl that gets fired that goes on and blasts you. But, you know, I asked them to do that for me and they did. There's 150 or something, but a lot of people look at your company and they say, well, I got a good Yelp. I got a good Google. I'm like, employees go to Indeed and they go to glass door to look at this stuff. And we don't really think about that stuff, but try to put yourself in the place of somebody that's looking for a job and what would you be attracted to? You know? Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for, uh, I mean, it's been a great conversation. We've touched upon a lot of different things. So I know that for different people listening, right, they're each taking away something, something very different. So how do people get a hold of you and what and where should they go? Yeah. I'm on Facebook and LinkedIn quite a bit. Tommy Mello with no W. So M-E-L-L-O. I wrote a book called The uh, Home Service Millionaire. It's how I went from $50,000 in debt. And I think at the time it was a $35 million company. Got a podcast called The Home Service Expert. I've had Michael Gerber on the podcast. I've had Gino Wickman. I've had some cool people on there that really offered a lot of insights on a lot of things. But yeah, or you can just hit me up at tmello at a1garage.com. That's my email. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Penny. It was a blast. I always have fun doing this kind of stuff. Awesome. And thank you all for listening because without you, there would be no show. So thank you guys for listening. Make sure that you, uh, you know, you you listen and write down a couple of takeaways from today's show and what you're going to put into action. I think we also heard from Tommy that it's, what are you going to do today? What are you going to do today? That's going to make you better today than you were yesterday. That's going to help you to get to whatever that goal is. So make that commitment, make it now, and then go do it. My name is Penny Zanker, and this is Take Back Time. I'll see you in the next episode. Thank you for listening. Today's topic is another opportunity for you to put the knowledge you learned into practice. 
Tune in again next week for more strategies that will help you have more energy and focus to get more done in less time so you can continue to take back time.